Oh, snap! That's right, today we're talking about polarity. Hit the theme! Ain't nothing but a cam thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shoo Fu Kemenacha. I'm your host, Shu, and with me as always is Fu. What up, nerds? So, Fu, today we're going to be talking a lot about tug of war. You're going down, Shu. So let's get started. Polarity, a lesson from the bonding unit. So what is polarity? I want you to think of bonding as a continuum of what happens to electrons. We're going to reference the image on the right here. So in image A, electrons are being shared equally. Now that purple blob represents the electron cloud where electrons are being shared and can be found. In C, the bottom one, you can see electrons have been transferred. These have formed two ions because the electron has completely gone from one to the other. So what's going on with B? Electrons are shared, but unevenly. So one element pulls the electrons more than the other. This is called polarity. Polarity is an uneven sharing or distribution of electrons. Think of the poles of a magnet. An ionic bond is formed when one of the atoms will lose its electron to the other atom. This results in a positively charged ion, called a cation, and a negatively charged ion, called an anion. Positive and negative attract, and the result is an ionic bond. Covalent chemical bonds involve the sharing of a pair of valence electrons by two atoms. There is also what is called polar covalent bonds. These are covalent bonds in which the sharing of the electron pair is unequal. The result is a bond where the electron pair is displaced toward the more electronegative atom. Let's begin with bond polarity, nonpolar bonds. Two nonmetals share electrons in a covalent bond evenly. The two nonmetals have equal attractions for the shared electrons, meaning they have equal electronegativities. This means we're going to look for two of the same element. Now, I want you to think as an analogy of me, Shu, versus my evil twin in an epic battle of tug of war. So we're both pulling on the rope, but because we're completely evenly matched, we're pulling on that rope, which represents the electrons, by the way, equally. So let's say this hand represents Shu, and this hand represents my evil twin. We're engaged in our tug of war battle. We've got two styrofoam spheres that represent the electrons. So they're both pulling these electrons, but they're pulling them equally, which means they are shared evenly right in the middle. So if you take a look at the image here of the nonpolar covalent bonding example, we have the molecule hydrogen, H2. Now, since hydrogen has the exact same electronegativity as hydrogen, they both have 2.2, there's zero difference in electronegativity between the two elements, so they share the electrons perfectly evenly, nonpolar. Polar bonds. Two nonmetals share electrons in a covalent bond unevenly. The two nonmetals have unequal attractions for the shared electrons, meaning they have different electronegativities. Look for different elements. The more electronegative element gets the partial negative charge, delta negative. I want you to think of me versus Shu in a tug of war. I'm clearly stronger, I'm gonna win, but Shu is still gonna hold on for dear life. All right, so now we've got Shu here on this hand, Fu on this hand, we've got our tug of war battle going, and although we are sharing the electrons, we're not sharing them equally, and that's because Fu is stronger, he's pulling the electrons more towards him, and that means we have an unequal sharing of electrons. If we take a look at our example, we have HCl. Clearly, we have two different elements sharing electrons in a covalent bond. Now, if you look at the electronegativities, hydrogen is 2.2, but chlorine is 3.2. So there's a small difference in electronegativity, not too big, of 1.0. Now, because chlorine has the higher electronegativity, it's going to pull those electrons a little bit more, and so it gets what we call the delta negative. Now, with the electrons sort of being pulled away from it because it has a weaker attraction, 
the hydrogen gets what we call a delta positive. And lastly, we have ionic bonds. A metal transfers electrons to a nonmetal. Since there is such a large difference in electronegativity, there is no sharing of electrons. Ionic bonds cannot be polar since the separate ions are fully charged. Now, as an example, think of me versus the Hulk in an epic battle of tug of war. So the Hulk is so strong and I'm so weak that he's just gonna rip the rope right out of my hands. Ah, I got rope burn! All right, now we've got Shu versus the Hulk. And remember, the Hulk is super strong, I'm super weak. So the Hulk is just gonna rip that electron away from me. And the electron is transferred, not shared. You try number one. Classify the following bonds as polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, or ionic. Let's take a look at some molecular polarity for nonpolar molecules. Molecules with an even distribution of electrons across their entire structure are called nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules are symmetrical in shape. If the bonds are nonpolar, then the molecule is nonpolar. If the bonds are polar, the molecule may be nonpolar. Depends on the shape. So if we take a look at our picture, we have chlorine Cl2. We have two of the same atoms, so this should be a nonpolar bond. But by default, having a nonpolar bond means the overall shape of the molecule is also symmetrical, and therefore the molecule is nonpolar. All right, let's do an example here. Shu, are you ready? Yes. All right, we're gonna determine the bond and molecular polarity of the structure below, okay? So we've got carbon bonded to four chlorines in our diagram. The first thing we wanna do is we're gonna label our bond polarity. So we're gonna look at all four of those bonds. Let's just look at one of them first. Okay. All right, so I've got a C and a Cl. Okay, so the bond between those, is it a polar bond or a non-polar bond? Uh, based on the fact that they're different elements, so they must have different electronegativities as a result, um, they would not share evenly, so it should be a polar bond. All right, good. So in order to determine which way those electrons are being shared more often, we need to actually look up the electronegativity values and figure out which one is higher. All right, so if I look at either the periodic table for trends, or I can go to table S, I see that chlorine has a higher electronegativity than carbon does. Good, so that means that our electrons are being shared more often towards chlorine. So we're gonna use this special arrow with a positive tail to it that's gonna point towards the more electronegative element. All right, so sort of like the electrons are going from carbon to chlorine, they're still being shared, but- Yeah, but just line. more often towards the chlorine. So let's do that for all of the bonds. All right, so it's like they're all kind of being pulled outward for each bond. Good, and our arrow, which is convenient now because once we figure out bond polarity, we can now determine molecular polarity. And we're gonna use that delta negative and delta positive. The nice thing about the arrows, they point toward the delta negative. Okay, so Cl then is where it's pointing towards. So that would be delta negative. It's sort of slightly negative, yeah. not fully charged negative like an ion. And that would mean um, it's kind of like there's a little plus on the end too. The carbon, where the um, arrow starts, would have to be the delta positive. Um, it's sort of slightly positive, sort of partially losing the electrons to the chlorine. Good. Okay. Um, so what next? So we, let's label those on our diagram. Okay. So C is delta positive. I guess each of the chlorines is delta negative. Looks good. All right, so now that we have the bond polarity in there and we have our partial charges, we're gonna look at the overall symmetry of our molecule. Okay. So we wanna look to see if it's symmetrical or if it's asymmetrical. So what do you think based on what we have drawn here? Um, well, kind of looks like with the arrows and the dots, it, it, I guess it kind of looks the same on all sides. So I would say that it's symmetrical. Yeah, and I would say the same too. Now it's important to note that we only draw on a 2D surface when in reality, these molecules are three dimensional. So okay. we have right here a model of what this would look like in three dimensions. And as you can see, it's not flat, right? So this is actually very symmetrical. Yeah, it looks the same everywhere pretty much. All the way around. And since electrons are all being pulled towards these chlorine atoms in opposite directions here, it is very symmetrical. So if it's symmetrical, this falls in line with our non-polar okay. molecule. So what you're saying then is, even though the bond is polar, overall the molecule can still be non-polar because it's symmetrical. Correct. Let's talk about the molecular polarity of polar molecules. 
Molecules with an uneven distribution of electrons across their entire structure are called polar molecules. Polar molecules are asymmetrical in shape. If there is only one bond and it's polar, then the molecule is polar. If the bonds are polar, the molecule may be polar. So if you take a look at our diagram below, we've got HCl and we have a polar bond between H and Cl. Since it's the only bond, this gives rise to a polar molecule. Let's take a look at another example. Are you ready, Fu? I am. All right, determine the bond and molecular polarity of the structure below. We have NH3 ammonia. We want to begin by looking at the bond polarity. So let's take a look at our bonds here. What elements do we have? I've got H and I've got N. All right, so we have to determine if the bond is polar or nonpolar. So tell me about those elements. Well, they're both different elements with different electronegativity, so it must be a polar bond. Good, let's write that down. Different atoms, different electronegativities means we have a polar bond. Now our molecule may be polar, it may be nonpolar. We have to find out. Let's look a little bit more into our polar bond. Um, we can do the arrows that we did in the previous example. So do you remember which way the arrow points? So the arrow always points towards the element that has the higher electronegativity. Good. So between N and H, which one has the higher electronegativity? Um, well, nitrogen does. Nitrogen does. Good. So let's draw our arrows. We can do three arrows. So my positive tip should be at the H. Good. The arrow has to be pointing towards the nitrogen. Good. We can also label our delta positives and delta negatives. So again, just to remind you, if we're the more electronegative element where the arrow is pointing, we should be delta negative. So nitrogen should be delta negative since Good. they're all pointing towards it. And hydrogen uh, is going to be delta positive. Good, let's add those to our diagram as well. Right. So they're all kind of converging here at nitrogen, so I'm going to put the delta negative here, and then delta positives on the outside. All right, now let's look at the molecule. We want to see, is it symmetrical or is it asymmetrical? So based on the shape, based on what you labeled, what are you thinking? Well, this one's kind of tough because it's not like the last one that had four bonds are on. I just see three here. Um, I'm tempted to say asymmetrical because of those those extra dots on top. Like there's no, there's nothing on top to kind of balance it out. Very good. In general, if you see unbonded pairs on your central atom, that's a pretty good sign that it's asymmetrical. If we were to look at NH3 in three dimensions, we'd see there's an extra stick to represent those electrons, but there's nothing bonded there. So it really does not look the same on all sides and therefore has to be asymmetrical. Okay. So let's model, or I'm sorry, let's label our molecule as so being- polar. Polar, good. Because it's a symmetrical. Good, so in our previous example, we had polar bonds, but overall the molecule is nonpolar. Now in this example, we have polar bonds and the molecule overall is polar. Good. Oh, snap. I'm a way better snapper than you. Oh, snap, S-N-A-P. Symmetrical, nonpolar molecule, asymmetrical, polar molecule. Great way to remember. Lastly, we're gonna talk about molecular geometries. We're gonna give these shapes some names specifically. Now, molecular geometries are based on something called VSEPR, or VASPR, which stands for valent shell electron pair repulsion. That's a lot of complicated words there, but what it means is because electrons repel each other, we have shapes in 3D that minimize this repulsion of the electrons to one another. Now, you're gonna to have to know these different shapes. We're gonna begin with a linear shape and if you take a look at the example over on the far right, we have CO2 for our Lewis dot diagram. Here's a model of it in 3D. You can see we've got one carbon in the middle, we've got two oxygens, and we've got two double bonds as represented by these springs. Now, it's in a straight line, we call it linear. I want you to label over to the right next to example for CO2 that this is a nonpolar molecule. Now, not all linear molecules are nonpolar, but this one in particular is. A couple ways you know this, we've got two of the same atoms on both sides of the molecule, but also really key is that we have no unbonded pairs on that central atom. No dots nonpolar! All right, so that makes this nonpolar. Continuing on, we have something called trigonal planar, BF3, remember boron stable with six valence electrons, so it can bond to three things. This makes a flat triangle, thus the name trigonal planar. It's sort of a flat plane. 
Again, I want you to label this molecule as being a nonpolar molecule. We have no unbonded pairs on the central atom. No dots, nonpolar! Continuing on with our shapes here, we have a tetrahedral molecule. Now, this is an example of a tetrahedral molecule. Tetrahedral means four-sided. So we actually have this triangular shape here as a side. So if you think of that one as the bottom, that's one side. We have a triangle on the back. We have a triangle on this side and the opposite side over here. That's four sides, tetrahedral. Now, tetrahedral molecules are usually with carbon in the middle because it makes four bonds to four different elements. Um, or for the same elements in this case, uh, which give rise to a very symmetrical molecule. So I want you to write down that this is a nonpolar molecule because it's symmetrical. Now, if you take a look at the diagram to the right, it has the wedged line and the dashed line. And that's where I want you to write down that this is a nonpolar molecule. The next shape we have is trigonal pyramidal. Now this is a little bit different than the tetrahedral shape we just went over. We've got our central atom here, which tends to be nitrogen because nitrogen makes three bonds. As you can see, these three bonded uh, atoms and the, on the bottom of this. Um, but we have a lone pair of electrons on top, non-bonded electrons, which are forcing these bonds, because this is repulsion, remember, to kind of move away. So it's different than the tetrahedron because the tetrahedron has the atom at the top here, where the trigonal pyramidal does not. So we can't call this tetrahedral. This one is trigonal pyramidal. Now, because there's no extra atom up here, this one ends up being asymmetrical. So since it's asymmetrical, this one is polar. So I would like you to label next to the diagram for NH3 that this one is a polar molecule. Our next shape is the bent molecule. Now, water is a bent molecule, and it's bent because it has these two non-bonding pairs of electrons on top of your central atom. Now, the carbon dioxide example we had in the previous slide was linear with two bonded atoms to it, and that's because there was no non-bonded pairs of electrons on the central atom. This one does, so it forces these two into a bent shape here. All right, so since this is bent, and I have dots on my central atom, this ends up being a polar molecule because it's asymmetrical. So I'd like you to label next to your diagram that this is a polar molecule. All right, continuing on, we have some examples of shapes that have expanded octets now. So for example, we have PCL5. This is called a trigonal bipyramidal shape. Now what's up with the name? Well, trigonal means three-sided, bipyramidal means two pyramids. So two three-sided pyramids. If you kind of take a look, one, two, three, that's our top pyramid, and on the bottom, one, two, three, that's our bottom pyramid. So we see that we're bonded to five things to make a shape called trigonal bipyramidal. Because we have no unbonded pairs here, this is going to be a nonpolar molecule. So again, if you would label this off to the side as a nonpolar molecule, please. Lastly, we have octahedral. What's up with that name, octahedral? Because we're actually bonded to six things, like SF6. Well, the name octahedral comes from the fact that if this was a solid object, we'd actually have eight sides. So actually two square pyramids. So one, two, three, four on the top, one, two, three, four on the bottom. So that's where the name octahedral comes from, despite being bonded to six things. One last time, we have no unbonded pairs on our central atom. So therefore, this is a nonpolar molecule. So please label this to the right. That's it for today's episode on polarity. Later, nerds. That's it for today's episode of, what are we doing? Oh, okay. So Hulk is go just gonna rip that electron right out. <laughs> what? The next shape we have is trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal to every PhD chemist I've ever talked to. <laughs> it's good. Not that they'll get it. It's good. <laughs> Let's take a look at another, uh, um, wrong focus there, chap. Beautiful. Special promotional consideration provided by Gucci Loops. Not feeling Gucci this morning? Now you are. But we never off, but we zone to the brick of dawn. S E I E N C E in the hall, they call S Wing. You know we never wear a tie like my homies, boys, two men. It's so hard to say goodbye. Like this, that, and this, and a. It's like that, and like this, and like that, and a. It's like this. You're going in low power mode. Plug in chill to the next episode.